Good morning, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Hello. This video today, I, uh, I'm looking at my uh, old laptop. I got my old laptop set up here. Um, today, going to be looking into this disturbing thing called pragmatism. A brother from Norway had asked me to look into this because apparently that um, Charles Dawson guy or Charles Lawson guy um, referred to himself as a pragmatic Christian. Um, and I, I will be honest with all of you, um, I have never heard or listened to a sermon or anything done by this Charles Lawson individual. Brother Brian has spake on uh, Charles Lawson quite a bit. And uh, you know what? Brother Brian has been at this far longer than I have. And um, he has made many warnings about Charles Lawson. Uh, so I'm going to take his word for it. <laughs> okay. But um, this pragmatism thing. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. But uh, before we get to that... Get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the truth, and the real scriptures. Um, we're going to be reading a bit here in the book of Colossians, chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 12. Now, a majority of the information about this pragmatism, which I have on my laptop here, I was going to use OBS because I got OBS now, um, and I almost got it figured out. The one thing I'm struggling with is once you get the browser up and um, uh, operative and you can go and search things on the browser in OBS, I just can't figure out how to scroll up and down or go side to side, anything like that, outside that little box. Um, that, that I'm trying to figure out. And once I get that figured out, then I'm going to be using OBS for quite a few many things. <laughs> Yeah, once I get that figured out, some things are going to change around here as far as uh, what you get um, uh, as the Lord will guide me on to. But uh, anyway, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 12. You are expected to follow me along, of course. Colossians chapter, one verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 12. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom? Who is the whom? Christ, God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay? Okay? We're going to get to about him giving uh, this stuff on to you liberally. We'll get to that later, okay? But let's continue. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For, th for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. There's the steadfastness, steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. Okay? In Christ. All right? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with 
thanksgiving. When you are saved and born again, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost. Ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost is the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay, the Lord is that spirit. And the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Okay, we understand that, right? Yes. So, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught. Now, God will use man to teach other brethren. Absolutely, yes. But it is the spirit of truth that will guide you into all truth. Okay? You have to remember that. Okay? Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Philosophy. What is philosophy? The wisdom of men. The wisdom of man. Okay? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Here's the definition. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay? Look at that verse. Philosophy. Definition. After, after the tradition of men. Man's wisdom. Okay? Vain deceit. After the rudiments of the world. Okay? And not after Christ. Christ is going to guide you in onto the scriptures, and he will guide you in and through the scriptures. Okay? Our walk is to be structured around the scriptures. Okay? We do not structure um, the scriptures around ourselves. No. This, the scriptures, are how we are to live. Especially for us today in this dispensation, okay, the time of the Gentiles, our instructions, our doctrine for us today is within the Pauline epistles. But this whole book is written for me. It's not all written to me, okay? Lots of instruction and in righteousness as well as to be found. Okay, but let's continue. For in him, from verse 9, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, the Holy Ghost is the spirit. God the Father is the soul. The Word made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the body. Okay. Body, soul, and spirit. Actually, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? The fullness of the Godhead. The Godhead. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? All right? Let's continue. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I've delved, I've delved into that verse on several other videos. Not going to dive into it now, okay? Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Okay? You're saved. You are born again. Converted. Okay? Okay? You die when you come unto the Lord. You die to yourself, to your self-righteousness. Okay? There is death. Okay? There is death. Because if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. 
All things have become new. Old things have passed away, remember? But looking at verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay? Go to 1 Corinthians now. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 on to verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 on to verse 21. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Some people could use um, what is known as dialect, okay? Uh, some people will disguise themselves as being of the church of the living God in the manner in which they speak. And hence they study such as the trivium to learn how to sentence, uh, structure their sentences, their words, their speech to be just as if they were of the church of the living God. Hence, the cross of Christ is made of none effect. See, I've been asked quite a few times, it's like, Brad, in your videos, who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, see? You click on one of these videos, you're watching this video, any of the videos that the Lord has done through me, I'm talking to you, whoever you are. I'm talking to you, okay? Just so you know, all right? But you have to be aware about that, about men who are so grammar, or so perfect in their grammar and their speaking that you can't get any air in between them. Hmm? The flakes of, of his flesh are so knit together that no air can get between them. I'm talking about Leviathan and uh, Job chapter, what is it? 41 or 40, I believe. Let's continue. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, not being saved, are saved. It is the power of God, the power of God versus the wisdom of men. Okay? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay? Now go to Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 8. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you're saved, born again, you know, converted of the church of the living God, you are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live. Yet not you, but Christ liveth within you. Christ and him crucified. Okay? If the Lord Jesus Christ lives within you, you know, and the Lord is that spirit, you are dead unto the world. You are dead unto sin. Doesn't mean you're not going to sin. Of course not. But once, what once was life to you in the world is now made odious, and you are dead unto it, so that you may live unto Jesus Christ. See, Verse 3, 
and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit, capital S, and of power. Okay? See, using the wisdom of men, philosophy such as pragmatism and whatnot, whatever you wish, to, whatever wisdom of men you want to try to bring in to justify yourself, okay? It's man's wisdom that you're doing. The wisdom of this world, the wisdom of your flesh, the wisdom of the devil, okay? And the power of God is the one who will enable you to speak his word, to learn of him, okay? Someone who is using dialect, who has mastered the trivium, who is perfect in their grammar, perfect in their sentence structure, know just what to say, that it sounds almost too good, right? Right? Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The power of God that will move you to do as you ought. Not by force, because we are servants, remember. Not slaves. That's why our, our obedience unto the scriptures is paramount. Let's continue. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Their hearts are perfect for the Lord. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. But none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, pragmatism. As I said, uh, I am just on here on Wikipedia, okay? Here is, in a nutshell, pragmatism. And this is as found on Wikipedia. Pragmatism. Pragmatism is a philosophical tradition <laughs> that considers words and thought as tools and instruments for prediction, problem solving, and action, and rejects the idea that the function of thought is to describe, represent, or mirror reality. Hmm. Sounds a lot like neuro-linguistic programming, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like metaphysical science or mind science. What is that? I'm not going to read these, but I just want to show you these. See this? See this? Uh, by the way, notice the uh, <laughs> um, Knights Templar uh, insignia right there. The crooked cross and crown, it's a symbol of the Knights Templar. This is science and health with key to the scriptures. This is the book of Christian science by the devil witch who is burning in hell right now, Mary Baker Eddy. Okay? Mary Baker Eddy, in this blasphemous, disgusting book, taught that Messiah was mine. That it's all in your mind. That you can heal yourself through your mind. Okay? That this is all an illusion. Okay? That's what this wicked woman taught. This is the secret. Uh, incidentally, that disgusting heretic devil, um, Joel Osteen, this is his religion. The law of attraction. That if you believe it, you can achieve it. You pray unto the universe or speak unto the universe 
ask the universe and the law of attraction will draw onto you whatsoever it will. In this disgusting book, um, it blasphemes the Lord saying to call yourself, I am. And remember Joel Osteen had a book called The Power of I Am? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, the power of I am. Blasphemy. Okay, but this, by the way, is the religion of Joel Osteen. You want to know what Joel Osteen is all about? Here it is. What he teaches? Here it is. Same with all these uh, word of faith twits. Okay, metaphysical mind science. Okay. The philosophy of men, man's wisdom. Okay. This stuff has a lot in common with pragmatism because it has one father, the devil, Satan. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Pragmatists contend that most philosophical topics, such as the nature of knowledge, language, concept, meaning, belief, and science are all best viewed in terms of their practical uses and successes. If it works, it's truth. Pragmatism began in the United States, so they claim, in the 1870s. Its origins are often attributed to the philosophers Charles Sanders Pierce, who we're going to look at, William James and John Dewey, who I believe was the mathematician who, uh, the Dewey Decimal System or something like that. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. In, in 1878, Pierce described it in his pragmatic maxim. Consider the practical effects of the objects of your conception. Then your conception of those effects is the whole of your conception of the object. Get a load of that. Whatever you believe to be true, it is true. If it works, it's truth. Let's let's look a little at this Charles Sanders Pierce guy, okay? Charles Sanders Pierce. If you go onto Wikipedia, you'll see this guy's picture. Okay? Charles Sanders Pierce. September 10th, 1839 to April 19th, 1914, was an American philosopher, logician, mathematician, and scientist who is sometimes known as the father of pragmatism. Educated as a chemist, alchemy, and employed as a scientist for 30 years, Pierce considered himself first and foremost a logician. He made major contributions to logic, just like Hegel did, right? <laughs> a subject that, for him, encompassed much of what is now called epistemology and the philosophy of science. Um, I haven't really looked into this guy, but um, I'm sure if you were to look, there may be, of course, a Jesuit tie, but... Around these times, people like this were more often than not associated with the Freemasons, the Masonic Orders, without a doubt. Uh, in one way or another, I can guarantee you this Charles Sanders Pierce guy, in one way or another, was linked onto the Vatican. You know, Mystery Babylon the Great, okay, Roman Catholicism. Uh, in one way or, or another, whether it was a direct Jesuit tie or a Masonic tie. And of course, today, the Masons are run and operated by the Jesuits. Okay, let's continue. He saw logic as the formal branch of semiotics, of which he is a founder, which foreshadowed the debate among logical positivists and proponents of philosophy of language. <laughs> that dominated 20th century Western philosophy. If you speak it, you can speak things into existence, pretty much. Yea, hath God said? Yeah. 
Additionally, he defined the concept of abductive reasoning as well as rigorously formulated mathematical induction and deductive reasoning. As early as 1886, he saw that logical operations could be carried out by electrical switch by electrical switching currents. Hmm. The same idea was used decades later to produce digital computers. Isn't that interesting, huh? Let's continue this. In 1934, the, ph the philosopher Paul Weiss called Pierce the most original and versatile of American philosophers and America's greatest log logician. Webster's bio uh, Biographical Dictionary said in 1943 that Pierce was now, now regarded as the most original thinker and greatest logician of his time. Hmm. Hmm. E. W. Kenyon, Essek W. Kenyon, okay? Who is this guy and what does this have to do with pragmatism? I'm going to show you the link between this Kenyon guy and this Pierce guy. That it's all up here, man's wisdom, okay? Philosophy, beware, lest any spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit. Kenyon was born on April 25th, 1867 in Hadley, New York. At age 17, he was converted in a Methodist prayer meeting. He became a church member in his early 20s and gave his first sermon at the Methodist Church of Amsterdam, New York, where he served as a deacon. Kenyon had a crisis of faith and left the faith for two and a half years prior to returning to faith in 1893. Hmm. Very interesting. Although desiring to be an actor, Kenyon earned a living as a piano and organ salesperson. In an attempt to hone his acting skills, Kenyon attended the Emerson School of Oratory in Boston for one year in 1892 studying acting. Kenyon first mar married Eva Sterling. The two were married on May 8, 1893. Shortly afterward, Kenyon attended the services of Calderon Street Baptist Church led by Pastor Adornam Judson, A.J. Gordon. At this service, Kenyon and his wife rededicated their lives to the Lord. Later that year, Kenyon joined the Free Will Baptists and became a pastor at a small church in Elmira, New York. In 1898, Kenyon opened Bethel Bible Institute in Spencer, Massachusetts, which remained in operation until 1923. He was its president for 25 years. The school later moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and became Providence Bible Institute, PBI. It later became Barrington College and merged with Gordon College, which was named after one of Kenyon's many mentors, A.J. Gordon. It is now known as Gordon College. Barrington College and Rhode Island, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, um, or Gordon College, excuse me, haven't checked on that for Jesuit ties, but <laughs> Jesuits are all over nowadays. Eva Kenyon, Eva, excuse me, Kenyon died in 1914. Subsequently, Kenyon married Alice M. Whitney and had a son and a daughter with her. In 1948, E.W. Kenyon died, and his daughter Ruth, with whom he was living, continued on with his publishing ministry. Now, positive confession and new thought controversy. It has been suggested by some that Kenyon was the originator of the modern positive confession theology, which is prevalent in word of faith Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism. Proponents of this view suggest that Kenyon's religious views 
were heavily influenced by the New Thought Movement during his time at the Emerson School, and that he developed the teaching of positive confession from that influence. According to Kenyan biographer Joe McIntyre, the actual influence Kenyon's time at Emerson had on this on his religious views is debatable. Instead, McIntyre suggests that Kenyon developed his positive confession teaching primarily from the teachings of the of holiness movement, faith cure and higher life movement ministries, ministers of the late 19th century. Evidence that the teaching of positive confession was already developing in Christianity before Kenyon is present in time period literature. In the 1884 book, The Atonement for Sin and Sickness, Russell Kelso Carter, demonstrates an early version of what Kenyon later taught. I only prayed, O Lord, make me sure of the truth, and I will confess it. I have nothing to do with consequences. That is thy part. Get a load of that. And again, Jesus has the keeping part. I have the believing and confessing, not being concerned with the consequences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In other words, I don't worry about my sin. Yeah, yeah. According to Newman F. Harrison, Kenneth E. Hagen, <laughs> if you don't know who he is, good, who was once thought to be the founder of Word of Faith movement, is no longer considered to be the founder or main source of its ideas. Harrison discusses the similarities between the writings of the two, which include entire passages, and resulted in critics arguing that Hagen plagiarized Kenyon. Okay? And hence, from this stuff, we can debate that, yes, word of faith came from this. But what does this have to do with pragmatism? How are these two linked? Okay? Here is the wiki on pragmatism. Philosophy of religion. Get a load of this. Get a load of this. Philosophy of re religion as regarding pragmatism. Both Dewey and James investigated the role that religion can still play in contemporary society. The former in a common faith and the latter in the Varieties of religious experience. From a general point of view, for William James, something is true only in so far as it works. Thus, the statement, for example, that prayer is heard may work on a psychological level, but A, may not help to bring about the things you pray for, B, may be better explained by referring to its soothing effect than by calming prayers than by calming prayers are heard. As such, pragmatism is not antithetical to religion, but it is not an apologetic for faith either. James' metaphysical position, however, leaves open the possibility that the Ontological claims of religions may be true. Of religions may be true. Because if they work, they're true. So let's let's roll this around in our heads a little bit. You you say you're a Christian. Okay? So if something works, it's true. And you're claiming to be a pragmatic Christian. So if it works, it's true. So you devise a certain prayer with certain words, and you do it this way once every uh, two weeks on Tuesday at the full moon, standing on one foot, hopping around, spinning in a circle, okay, uh, saying something and that because it works, right? Hey, it works. 
made me feel better. Might not have answered the prayer, but it works because I feel better. I feel in touch with my creator. So then, okay, if it works, it's true. So then what would prevent one who calls himself a Christian from also encompassing some of Buddhism into their walk? You know, sitting there cross-legged with your, your hands weird like that and looking up like that and meditating, it, meditating as the Buddhists do? Hmm? What about take some of uh, Islam, okay, and incorporate it into your walk, right? Hmm? How about take a little of everything? How about make your faith a smorgasbord of all the best stuff? It's dangerous. Very dangerous. Let's continue this, however. Okay? As we individual's life and refer to claims that cannot be verified or falsified either on intellectual or common sensorial grounds. Senses. Led by the senses. Flesh. Okay? Joseph Margolis in Historied Thought. Constructed World, California, 1995, makes a distinction between existence and reality. He suggests using the term exists only for those things which adequately exhibit Pierce's secondness. Things which offer physical resistance to our movement. In this way, such things which affect us, like numbers, may be said to be real. Although, although they do not exist, Margolis suggests that God, in such a linguistic usage, might very well be real, causing believers to act in such, in such and such a way, but might not exist. Get a load of that. And see, that stuff ties in with this garbage that, okay? What is that? Go to Genesis chapter three now. Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, verses one on to verse five. You ought, to, you ought to know this by heart. Genesis chapter three, verses one on to verse five. Now the serpent, who is the serpent? The devil. Satan. We're going to look at that in Ezekiel. So, okay. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? What does Satan do? Question God's word. And who did he go to? Did he go to Adam? No, he went to Eve. Okay? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, which God never said. You can check that on your own time, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, <laughs> you shall not surely die. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. Okay? 
knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. You become your own gods. You are the standard of truth. You are your own judge. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 14, again, very familiar verses, which you ought to know by heart. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12, on to verse 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five, death. Okay? Yet, for all your I wills, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Right? Go to Ezekiel now. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. We will be reading... Verses 11 on to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 on to verse 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the in Eden, the garden of God. Now, could Tyrus physically have been in Eden? No. Okay? No, he could not. Who was in the garden of Eden? The serpent. Who's the serpent? While Tyrus was there, the Lord is talking to, to the one who is in Tyrus. Okay? Just like he said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? Very similar the comparisons between Tyrus and Peter before Peter, before Peter was converted. Okay? Thou hast been in Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Okay? Satan, Lucifer, is a created being. Not omnipresent. Got to remember that. Okay. Thou art the anointed cherub. That covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down. In the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways. From the day that thou wast created. Till. Iniquity was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned therefore i will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of god tying into isaiah chapter 14 verse 15 okay and i will destroy thee o covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Right here. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Ye shall be as gods. Knowing good and evil. Okay. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom 
by reason of thy brightness, O son of the morning. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. What is this wisdom and beauty? His pride himself. He was taken with his own beauty, his own pride, his own wisdom. Okay? Okay? You have to remember that. Now go to Luke chapter 4. This pragmatism thing. I'm going to say it right at the start. It's satanic. It's satanic. Trying to take philosophy, the wisdom of men, and apply it onto our faith, on our Lord Jesus Christ, the philosophy of men to interpret the scriptures. The spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Okay? This wisdom doesn't come from above, but is earthly, sensual, sensual, devilish, led by your senses. Okay? Go to Luke chapter 4. Again, familiar verses here. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 13. Very important to get this. Okay? And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. And was led by the Spirit, capital S, into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shewed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Now, hold on. You want to know what probably the biggest form of idolatry there is? You worshiping yourself. I don't worship myself, really. Okay? See, that's why coming to the Lord on his terms, broken and contrite, is required of you. Because if you still think you're a good person and you are judging what works to apply it onto your faith, you are your own God. You are your own judge. You are your own idol. Self worship, self righteousness. My opinion is the ultimate form of idolatry. Because you have made yourself, your wisdom, your beauty, an idol. He hath not said. Let's continue. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See, if you serve yourself, if you worship yourself, you're actually falling down and worshiping Satan. Because as we read in Isaiah chapter 14, 
I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Okay? I will be like the Most High. Your self-righteousness is satanic. Let's get right down to it. Your self-righteousness is your idolatry. Let's continue. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Now watch this, as we all know, look what Satan does. For it is written, he's quoting scripture. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Speaking of himself, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See, Satan took this out of context. But he used it to push his own agenda. As if God the Father would worship Satan. Are you kidding? <laughs> but see, Satan puts that out there. Everything will be yours. You eat that fruit and your eyes will be open. And ye shall be as gods. Ye shall be like the Most High, knowing good and evil. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And we have to remember, brethren, when it comes to philosophy and nonsense like this pragmatism stuff, go to 2 second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 on to verse 20. But what I do, that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. They may be found even as we, pretending to be of us, but yet not of us. Okay? That's what that means. Okay? They're desiring an occasion to make it look as if they are of the church of the living God. Okay? Using their philosophy. Using their very, uh, vain deceit. Here, pray this way. This works. So it must be true. Meditate this way. It works. Huh? It must be true. Say these certain prayers to rout demons. It works. It must be true. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence and boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. See, because they're seeking occasion. To, to puff up your flesh. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, smite you on the face you put up with it 
with the lies. Because it makes you look good, right? It gives you this thing of, I'm wise. I have wisdom, right? You have wisdom. You have to remember, brethren, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 on to verse 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 on to verse 12. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Referring to the church of the living God being resurrected, taken out of the way, so that the son of perdition may be revealed after we are taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Remember this. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, if you're basing your faith off of what only works, right? You're your own judge. You're your own God. You're not basing that upon the scriptures, dear friend. Not at all. Not at all. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Do to, go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Verses 1 on to verse 5. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out to the land of Egypt. For us, for our instruction in righteousness, remember, Egypt is a type of the lost world that our Lord has brought us out of, okay? And redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Okay? Guess what? Satan can be allowed to make things happen, to uh, do signs and wonders. So you may see, so you may know, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you trust on him, our Lord Jesus Christ, and his word, the authorized version of the scriptures. Because remember, in Exodus chapter 7, okay, and in Exodus chapter 8, where the magicians were also able, the magicians of Egypt were also able to make a rod, okay, bring up frogs, uh, were able to make water uh, into blood, okay? Satan can make certain things come to pass to deceive you. You have to remember that. So, number one, this idea that, okay, if it works, it must be true. Man. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. That could lead to you being deceived. Big time. Big time. Go to Deuteronomy now, chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know that to know what was in thine heart. God knows what's in your heart. He knows everybody. Remember, everyone who is alive is written in the book of the living. Okay? He knows all men. Not through a relationship, no. But he knows all men. What he's talking about is so that you, yourself, will know. You know, examine yourself. Prove your own self, whether or not you are in the faith. Okay? Okay? Let's continue. Let's read that again. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with men which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, we already looked at that in Luke chapter 14, uh, 4, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Hold your place here. Go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. This is applicable in Jeremiah chapter 10 onto debunking the heretical uh, thing of Christ Mass. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 8. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Pragmatism, okay? For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and wash and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. And now go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me. O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. The Lord proves you to yourself. See, David here is asking him for the Lord. Hey, Lord, please show me my sin. Show me my heart. Try me that I may know what's in my own head, where I stand with you, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Self examination again, brethren. Okay? We'll go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Okay? Verse 4. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. 
thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. You got to look, when it comes to wealth too, brethren, you have to get out of your mind just the mere facet of money. There are many other forms of wealth. We just naturally think of money. But there are other forms of wealth. Many other forms of wealth. Okay? Not just money. You have to be aware of that. Okay? But look at this. And thou say in thine heart, my power and, my, and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You, at a smorgasbord, get to pick all these things which work, right? If they work, it's true, right? How do you know what is from Satan? How do you know which is from the Lord thy God? Searching the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Is God for pragmatism? No, he is not. God is a jealous God. And you looking for just what works so that you may get by? Who's number one in your life? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Or you, yourself, and I? Because if you're a pragmatic Christian, you are your own God. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day, that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient on the vo unto the voice of the Lord your God. Go to Isaiah chapter 45. Now. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Uh, 
All right. Isaiah chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For, my, for Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. People like to tie this, this uh, Cyrus anointing onto Trump. <laughs> when Cyrus fulfilled this, okay? Cyrus fulfilled this with uh, Ezra. Okay, allowing Ezra to go back to Jerusalem. Okay, okay, trying to put Donald Trump into this, you're a heretic. And just seeking to make merchandise of the church of the living God. Verse 5 I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands? Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. And he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a very important uh, verse to remember for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? Very important for our instruction in righteousness. Who raises you up? Who will direct your way? Who gives to you what is needful? Who sets you free? From the bondage of your last of your lost life, not for price, no reward. Who does that? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt, labor of the world for instruction and righteousness, and the merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over unto thee. And they shall be thine. They shall come after thee. In chains they shall come over. And they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplications unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed, and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Now, in context, statutes, yes. But remember, covetousness is idolatry. Okay? And you, being pragmatic, number one, being pragmatic, 
facing proof of only what works? Uh, no, it doesn't work, dear friend. It doesn't work. You're tempting the Lord your God, number one. Number two, you are exalting your own self above the Lord. Think about it. Think about it. Like these twits, the law of attraction and uh, metaphysical mind science. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You are your own gods. Pragmatism is of the devil. Verse 17, but Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed or confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Look at this. I have not spoken in secret. In a dark, in dark place, in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seeking me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. The scriptures. He declares things that are right. Our faith, our walk, is to be based upon the scriptures. Not just merely what works. Because remember, Satan wants to be like the Most High. And he can deceive you by making something come to pass. You'll need, he is allowed it of God for those of you of the Church of the Living God who may be falling for this nonsense. There cannot be such a thing as a pragmatic member of the church of the living God. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. <laughs> Every pun intended. Every pun intended. Verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. And the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory in the Lord. In the Lord, dear friends. Now go to Judges. Go to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Verses 1 under verse 15. Okay, this is after the death of Joshua. Okay, and the children of Israel, if you read in Judges chapter 1, didn't fulfill everything that they were supposed to do about driving out all the inhabitants of the land. Okay, now check this out. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 15. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, 
but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bohim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the mountain in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Now hold on. Here in this country, there was a generation many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> actually over a hundred years ago, which did hold to the standards of Scripture way back when. But what has happened, yea, hath God said, philosophy, all these heresies, has been brought about. And remember, was Scott and Hort in the 1800s, in what, 1888 or something like that? Brought out their new Greek test, uh, new Greek texts for the New Testament. Okay, you have to remember that. Yea, has God said. And the generations following have been declining, 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 and declining, being spoiled further and further. Okay, and today. Right now, right now, January the 11th, January the 11th, 2021. And there arose another generation, generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Okay? There's a famine in the land of hearing of the words of the Lord. Okay? There is. Oh, there are many voices out there speaking many things. There are. But they question what God has said and they bring in philosophy and vain deceit. You see, yea, hath God said from the very beginning has wrought such devastation and is continuing. And there are those out there who claim to be of the church of the, of the living God, but rather are just Christians, have brought in all these other things. See what works. Hey, if it works, it's true, right? Hence, spoiling, spoiling the vines. <laughs> These truly are unique times that we are living in, brethren. Truly unique times that we are living in. Let's continue. And because of this, because that generation died out, that did not bring up the generation after them, that didn't know the Lord. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And served Balim. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. Which brought them out of the land of Egypt. And followed other gods. Of the gods of the people that were round about them. And bowed themselves unto them. And provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord. And served Baal. 
and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were very and they were greatly distressed. And look at what is known as modern Christianity today. It's a mess. It's a mess. A smorgasbord, smorgasbord of all things blended into one thing. Kind of like the Tower of Babel. Ecumenicalism, see? Which was the goal of the uh, Vatican II, which was Vatican II, Vatican Council II, which I have a copy right over there, okay? Which is a masterpiece of the Jesuits, bringing everybody into the under, under Rome once again. Once again, just like the Dark Ages. Now, something very interesting. Go to Second Chronicles. Go to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 25. Be precise. Second Chronicles chapter 25. We will be reading verses 1 on to verse 16. Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Now it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him, that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father, but he slew not their children but did as it is written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for their father, for the fathers, but every man shall die of his own sin. But every man shall die for his own sin. Beg your pardon. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds according to the houses of their fathers, throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from twenty years old and above, and found them three hundred thousand choice men, able to go forth to war, that could handle spear and shield. He hired also an hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel, for an hundred talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. Okay? But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Then Amaziah separated them, to wit, the army that was come out of Ephraim, to go home again, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. And Amaziah strengthened himself, and led forth his people, and went to the valley of salt, and smote the children of Seir ten thousand. And other ten thousand left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them onto the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock that they all were broken in pieces. Now, the Lord wrought this victory for Amaziah. Obviously. Obviously. Okay? He did. You're not reading with me. But now check this out. Check this out. After what the Lord did for Amaziah. Look at this. 
But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even on to Beth Haron, and smote three thousand of them, and took much spoil. Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir, and set them up to be his gods, and bowed down himself before them, and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass, as he talked with him, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear. In other words, shut up. Why shouldest thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee, because thou hast done this, and hast not hearkened. Unto my counsel. He brought back the gods of Seir, of Edom, after he had destroyed them, after the Lord had wrought a great deliverance. Here's the instruction in righteousness. Our Lord has wrought a great deliverance in you, a great victory, taking you from Egypt out of the lost world and guiding you unto heaven, has sealed you. With that Holy Spirit of promise, you are his. You are his property. You are become a new creature. Okay? What are you doing going after other gods? What are you doing going after the wisdom of men and setting them up for yourself? Are you your own God? Are you your own judge? Hmm? Second Chronicles chapter 28. We're going to skip around in this a little. Second Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 on to verse 4. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made also molten images for Baalim. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire. After the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel, he sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Let's uh, deliver. Uh, let's read verse 5. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Now, skipping to verse 16. And we will be reading verses 16 on to verse 25. Okay? At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. For again the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh and Ajalon and Gideroth and Shokot with the villages thereof, and Timnath with the villages thereof, Gimzo also and the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and trespassed sore against the Lord. Okay? And we saw from verses 1 on to verse 5 actually here of just how vile King Ahaz actually was. Okay, now let's continue. And Tilgath Pilsner, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord, and out of the house of the king, and out of the and of the princes, and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. 
And in the time of his distress, in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria help them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. If it works, it must be true. Look at this verse again. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. The gods of Damascus. Damascus, which smote Ahaz. Okay? God allowed that to happen because of what King Ahaz had done. Okay? And Ahaz here, putting into the equation, well, hey, it, it, it must work for them. That they came and beat me. Never putting into the equation that he had sinned against the Lord. That he was doing contrary to the Lord. Not examining himself truthfully. But looking for what works. You see that? And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God. And cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every, and in every several city of Judah. He made high places to burn incense unto other gods. And provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. See, you're looking outside of the scriptures. For if it works, it must be true. Right? If it works for them, then hey, it must be true. It's relative. It's dependent on your perception, upon your thought, upon your own doing. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see? Every philosophy, pragmatism, metaphysical mind science, the law of attraction, Pentecatholism, <laughs> Catholicism, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You are your own deciding factor. You judge what works or not. When we have already looked within the scriptures that, you know, a false prophet can speak truth sometimes. The devil can be allowed to bring things to pass, to prove you to yourself. You see, going after this pragmatism or calling yourself a pragmatic Christian, yeah, you are a pragmatic Christian. Because remember, Mormons are Christians, Catholics are Christians, right? Right? Blending everything together. Ecumenicalism. Yea, hath God said. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Bring only the best of everything that works. And put that together. And call that Christianity. There is no such thing as someone being pragmatic of the church of the living God. There's no way. There's no way. And brethren, that Charles Lawson called, referred to himself as a pragmatic Christian. No. No, no. 
I would venture a guess that that man probably isn't really saved. If he's a pragmatic Christian. Yeah. 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 Because you have to remember something, brethren. You have to remember something. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5, and on to verse 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And? Go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again. Not Revelation, Brad. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 on to verse 31. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because those guys in that grouping, not that the Lord will not call those people to salvation. He has called all men unto salvation. But these guys here, the wise, the mighty, the noble, what do they have? They have a stumbling block. They can stumble over their wisdom. They can stumble over their might. They can stumble over their nobility. They can stumble over themselves, lifting up themselves, that they are their own gods. Okay? That's why it says, not many. Not many. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, you got to remember that because these men here that are listed, wise, mighty, and noble, why there are not many is because they could exalt themselves. It takes a great humbling and nothing but a miraculous work of the Lord to bring down someone who is wise, mighty, and noble unto true brokenness and repentance of themselves, see. But these guys have a snare. Because, verse 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mind, mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, despised, hath God chosen, yea, things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Look at that contrast, okay? Look at that contrast. Not many wise, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, okay? Not many mighty, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Not many noble are called, and base things of the world. We are base as the church of the living God in the eyes of the world, don't you know? And things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And right here ties it all up. That no flesh should glory in his presence. See, wise, mighty, and noble can glory in their flesh. That's why not many. Because they stumble from the flesh. You shall be as gods. You are your own judge. You are your own God. You decide what works. You decide what is truth. You are your own authority. You judge what applies to you in the scriptures sometimes even, don't you? Right. 
Our lives are fashioned by the scriptures. We do not uh, fashion the scriptures according to our lives, dear friends. You have to remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and about the lying signs and wonders, dear friends. You have to remember that. You have to remember that. Just because something works. Yeah, it might be true in the fact that it works, sure. But it don't mean that it's of God. You have to remember that. Because remember, the magicians of Egypt in Exodus chapter 7 were also able to do the things that Aaron and Moses were doing onto a point. You have to remember that. You have to remember that. Okay? Okay? Verse uh, 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay? Now, go back to Proverbs chapter 20 now. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? And Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. Actually, let's read verses 25 and verse 26. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God if you trust your own heart. But whoso walketh wisely he shall be delivered. And let's read verse 27. He that giveth unto the poor shall not laugh, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. And with that, of course, go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. See, that's why you trust on the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Because when you start leaning onto your own understanding, you get puffed up. And you fall for garbage like pragmatism. And some can even fall for this garbage. Pragmatism is of Satan, brethren. It is the wisdom of men. Beware of pragmatism. And if anybody is calling themselves a pragmatic Christian, get away from such a one as that. Because they are their own judge. They are their own God. They are the ones who are deciding what is and what is not. You have to be aware of that. And if that, that Charles Lawson guy is, is a pragmatic Christian, get away from him. Because as we saw, the devil can speak truth, can he not? I want to leave you with something very compelling. <laughs> Go to Judges chapter 17. I was going to get into some other verses, but I'm going to save that for a later video. Just a little touch on this kind of stuff, okay? Go to Judges chapter 17, okay? Go to Judges chapter 17. We're going to end this video on this note.
Judges chapter 17. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I have wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made them a graven image and a molten image. And they are in, and they were in the house of Micah. Okay. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephah and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. He made his own gods. He made an ephod, a covering. And he consecrated one of his sons to be his priest. Hmm. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes, eyes of flesh, not through the eyes of Scripture, the lens of Scripture. See? And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city of Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Well with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. Well, well, look what he gave this Levite. Silver, a suit of apparel, victuals. I'll be a priest, sir. Sure, you want to give me this? Hey, this works, right? Hey, I'm getting what I want here. I'll give you what I what you want. See how it works? And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. Uh, you read the book of Leviticus about consecrations, also in um, Exodus and also in Numbers about consecrations. And here's some guy who made himself a house of gods, made himself an ephod, is consecrating a Levite to his priest. Hmm. And the Levite being content to dwell with this guy because of what he was getting out of it. See how it all worked together for everybody here? That everybody was so happy, right? And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good seeing I have a Levite to my priest. You see? Because it will do you good 
Whatever works is truth. No, my friend. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the spirit of truth shall guide you into all truth. Brethren, just because something works does not make it true. Just because something works for you does not mean that it is directly from the hand of God. God may be allowing the devil to tempt you that you may be proved to yourself whether or not you are in the faith. And this pragmatism stuff is very subtle. Now the serpent was more subtle than any creature of the earth that our Lord God had made. I just paraphrase that, excuse me. This pragmatism is very subtle. Brethren, pragmatism is of the devil. It has, yea, hath God said. That's all it is. Beware of it. And if you have come across someone who is calling themselves a Christian and also tagging to their being a Christian, pragmatic, get away from them. Because they, they are their own gods. They are their own standard. They are judging their own things by their own wisdom. Okay? So that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully this will help you um, about uh, watching out for this nonsense called pragmatism. Uh, on to you, brother, that sent this, uh, who requested this. I hope this helps. Um, yeah. I hope this helps. Um, gonna go. It is now nine forty six. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Church of the Living God. Thank you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We love you all so very much. And um, we will see you in the next video. Okay. Bye-bye.